It's October 10, 1998. North Jersey gangster Joey Masella gets a call from a mafia bookmaker named Steve. Steve was in debt to Masella, and he told the gangster over the phone that he had some 10 large ready for him. Masella was a man leading a failing life. He was in debt a few hundred grand, and had a string of filled gambling businesses behind him. He drove to their agreed meeting spot, only to find no one there. He receives another call from the indebted man, saying to meet him at another location. Masella then travels up to Brooklyn, New York, stopping the parking lot of the Diker Beach Golf Course, where Steve said he'd meet. As Masella sat in his car, however, a familiar face approached him, that a fellow gangster, Anthony Greco. Greco pulls out a handgun and guns Masella down right in his driver's seat. Crime in New Jersey. This time, calling repeated mob boss Simone de Cavacanti or Sam the Plumber before a federal grand jury. Of those charged, the most important is Sam de Cavacanti, reputed head of a prominent New Jersey mafia family and well known to the FBI. Who... The police informant had been rigged with a hidden tape recorder and then he talked to people to whom he owed money. In one conversation, played in court today. It's the early 1930s. New Jersey is a state divided amongst numerous organized crime clans, some domestic and some foreign. New York crime bosses Giuseppe Masseria and Gaetano Reina have their own independent factions in the state, while Abner Zwillman, a member of the Jewish mob and friend to New York gangster Meyer Lansky, holds a stake in the city of Newark. The Philadelphia crime family of Salvatore Sabella also has operations in the southern portion of the region. When it came to the actual New Jersey bosses, however, the scene was divided into two factions. The Newark faction, controlled by Gaspare D'Amico, and the Elizabeth faction, controlled by Stefano Badami. It's September 22nd, 1886. Gaspare D'Amico is born into a Sicilian family in Villabate. He and his brother would immigrate to the U.S. early on, followed later by the rest of their family. After landing in New Jersey, D'Amico would move to Newark, where he would begin his own bootlegging gang in the 1920s, which later on grew to be a much larger organization by the 30s. Stefano Badami was born in December of 88 in the Palermo neighborhood of Corleone in Sicily. He lived a large portion of his life there, getting married to a woman named Giuseppa in Roccamanna. However, on March 15, 1927, Badami would land in New York City, alongside his friend Salvatore Panino. Both men had sailed over from France and were traveling on visas issued in Tunisia, which at the time was a French territory. Badami moves in with his brother-in-law, a man named Tommaso Galliano, and continues pursuing a life of crime. During the Prohibition era, when the state was split amongst numerous criminal factions, Badami controlled Elizabeth while D'Amico controlled Newark, both men engaging in their own bootlegging trade. However, due to the different hands that held power in Jersey, the state of organized crime there was all but organized. That all changed at the onset of the Castellamorese War in New York. The war was waged between New York crime bosses Giuseppe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, the name of the conflict coming from Maranzano's hometown of Castellamorese del Golfo. Badami, who was opposed to New York's influence in his territory, stood with Maranzano out of opposition to Masseria. On April 15, 1931, Masseria was killed by his own men, who struck a secret deal with Maranzano, and the war was over. Maranzano declared himself the boss of all bosses, and split New York City into five crime families. His victory also meant another thing. Badami was now the confirmed boss of Elizabeth. This victory, however, was short-lived. Don't ever call again, or I must have you. On September 10, 1931, four Jewish gangsters walked into Maranzano's office at the New York Central Building. They used disguises, dressing as federal agents, 
to disarm Maranzano's bodyguards. Two of the gangsters then walked into his office. His killers were sent by Charlie Luciano, one of the men who turned on Masseria in Maranzano's favor earlier that year. With Maranzano now dead, his rivals also began coming after his allies, namely Stefano Badami. Over the next few months, his underboss, Sam Monaco, alongside a string of other connected men, were murdered, and he decided to walk away as the smoke cleared. Badami stepped down, of course temporarily, and D'Amico became the new leader of the Elizabeth Newark Mafia. It's 1935, Vincenzo Troia has begun a plan to take over the North Jersey Mafia by force. Troia, who'd originally worked with Luciano during the Castellamorese War, was a close associate to Maranzano. At the age of 26, in 1902, Troia would murder a man named Joe Catania, who owed him a major debt. He was let go without any punishment. After coming to the US and using his gang connections to establish his name, Troia would join the Castellamorese War and be on the winning side. However, when Maranzano was murdered and his faction lost control over North Jersey, Troia decided to form a revenge plan to take over the region. On the night of August 22nd, 1935, Troia was gunned down, possibly by D'Amico's soldiers. The battle for North Jersey didn't cease. In 1937, Joseph Profacci, the Sicilian-born boss of the Profacci family, would make an attempt on D'Amico's life. It was speculated that Profacci, a successful businessman with strong gang ties, was doing the hit as he was originally loyal to Maranzano. D'Amico decided to flee the US following this and went home to Sicily. With him out of the picture, the commission split the land up amongst numerous families, including Badamis. He then re-emerged as the new boss of the now official North Jersey Mafia. Like Badami, however, was a controversial man, and with time, the Newark faction of the family would turn against him. In 1955, while sitting at Vito's Clam Bar in Newark, his old underboss's brother, Frank Monaco, would walk into the restaurant and stab a 66-year-old Badami to death. The killer was then arrested. After his burial, a new boss would need to be named, a man named Filippo Amari. Amari was Badami's current underboss and following his passing, would become the official boss. He was mainly focused on the world of extortion, union racketeering, and drug dealing in the Newark area. However, his reign was cut short as well, after a mutiny formed against him. The Newark and the Elizabeth factions were at each other's throats yet again, and in 1957, less than two years after taking the head role, Amari would flee back to Sicily, leaving yet again another power vacuum in the family. This vacuum was then seized by Nick Del More, the family's underboss. Del More was an old school bootlegger and gangster, a native of Nicosia in Sicily. Unlike the men before him, Del More didn't cause quite a stir due to his reputation of respectability. The two sides of the conflict eased as things became more serious in the region. By this point in time, the Elizabeth Newark family was a fully established mafia organization operating secondhand to those of New York. The family held anywhere between 30 and 35 officially made men, them being one of the country's smallest at the time. However, due to both their geographical position and family history, the five administrative families of New York didn't really view the New Jersey mob with much respect. When men struggled to be made in New York, they would settle for their partners in North Jersey, a clear sign of their position in the hierarchy. Nonetheless, the family was still represented in the commission. In 1957, when Genovese crime boss Vito Genovese held the infamous Appalachian meeting, Del More attended with two gangsters, Newark captain Frank Maggiore and family underboss Louis Larasso.
The jury was born back in April of 1909 and led most of his young life as a New Jersey area gangster. When Amari became the family boss, he made Majuri a Kappa regime, which was a major step up. In the mid-50s, he would be promoted to family underboss, a high-ranking role that others had only dreamed of. However, when Del More took over as family head, one of the first administrative decisions was to demote Majuri back to a capo, and the gangster had no choice but to accept it. His role then went to the younger Larasso, as Del More continued running things in North Jersey. It's 1964. North Jersey crime boss Nick Del More is sitting on his deathbed at a local hospital. Before his death, he decided to name a successor, his nephew, Simone de Cavalcante. It's April 30, 1913. Simone de Cavalcante is born into the family of Frank de Cavalcante and Maria Antoinette, both immigrants from Italy. He was born in Brooklyn, but shortly after his birth, the de Cavalcantes moved down to Trenton, New Jersey where Simone was raised. Connected into the local mafia by blood, De Cavalcante got an early start in the gang underworld and rose up over the next five decades to the top spot. When Del More stepped down from the top role, his first choice was De Cavalcante. By 1964, although things were slowly stabilizing in North Jersey, the family was still a disorganized group of rivaling gangsters that, to the men up north, were nothing more than a bunch of farmers. The Cavalcante, however, was a sharp dressing and cunning man who transformed his inherited criminal organization into a respectable and feared regional force. He instituted new policies like mafiosi dress codes, limits on facial hair, and removed things that he didn't see as necessary, such as the use of a gun and knife in the family initiation ceremony. While the gun, knife, and holy card burning are all historically symbolic elements of the ritual used by most Cosa Nostra organizations for decades, the Cavalcante didn't see them as needed in any real way, and couldn't care less how the New Yorkers viewed him. As family boss, he owned a storefront in Kenilworth, New Jersey, a plumbing supply store named Kenilworth Plumbing and Heating Company. As a result of this, the Cavalcante would get the nickname Sam the Plumber. But Sam was no plumber. He used the shop as a source of both legitimate and taxable income as a way to dodge law enforcement. However, behind closed doors, the Cavalcante ran a smooth ship, owning stakes in numerous rackets across the East Coast, including a lucrative loan sharking operation, multiple gambling rackets, and pornographic businesses. He was a smooth-talking and diplomatic man that enjoyed luxury and lavishness. Although he was called the Plumber, the Cavalcante preferred more elegant titles like Princeton Sam or the Count. He was a violent and tough, but smart and calculated man, and as a result of this, by 1964, the Cavalcante hadn't even spent a night behind bars. He doubled the family's made men count from the 30s to the 60s, and had men out on the street doing all kinds of things. One of the more notable of these men was Gatan. Vestola. Vestola, born on May 20, 1928, held a large hand over the music industry. He began his true career as a gangster in 1946, when an 18 year old Vestola was arrested for a New York City burglary. He got a suspended sentence, however, due to his age, and was instead given probation. In the mid 50s, Vestola would enter the music industry and exercise mob control over it becoming a promoter for famous musicians like Ray Charles. Based out of Brooklyn, Vestola owned Roulette Records, a 1960s record label founded by Morris Levy in 57. Levy, beginning his career as a nightclub manager in New York, would meet numerous musicians through his growing line of business, and his career would only expand from there. With the help of the mob, Roulette Records would grow to encompass numerous genres of music, 
Investola had himself listed as a songwriter for numerous doo-wop singles from groups like the Cleftones and the Wrens. However, Vestola also found a lucrative business in counterfeiting music, which he made over half a million from. This landed him a year-long stint in prison in 1960 for trademark offenses. In 65, Vestola was arrested yet again for larceny and would sit in jail for a long time. Meanwhile, Majuri would see a career boost when the Cavalcante would promote him. In order to avoid tension amongst the organization's ranks, he kept Larasso as the family underboss, but made Majuri the new consigliere, which was an appreciated decision. In 1965, Larasso was asked by Gambino family boss Carlo Gambino to do a favor for his family. He wanted the Cavalcantes to whack his associate, Joey Feola. Fayola was a member of Gambino's organization who held a large role in the Westchester, New York waste disposal business. In fact, he was essentially the kingpin of garbage out there and planned to expand into North Jersey, the Cavalcante's territory. Both Gambino and the Cavalcante didn't like what they were seeing and decided the man had become an unreliable businessman. He was getting in the way of a major business deal and so the okay was given to murder the man. On the night of his death, Larasso lured Fiola to a garage in New Jersey, strangled him, and buried him, confirming the murder to Gambino garbage cap regime, James Fela. Meanwhile, unknown to the Cavalcante and his associates, the FBI had been picking up every correspondence between the gangsters and had begun to prepare a case against the family. It's October 23rd, 1964. Thomas G. Dunn, the mayor of Elizabeth, New Jersey, walks into the office of Sam de Cavalcante in Kenilworth to procure some business. He asks the crime boss to help him with an issue he's having. He wants two men who were posing a threat to his campaign kept quiet, and de Cavalcante responds by providing his full support to the mayor so long as he could get some work in the city. However, as the Cavalcante sat in his office and ruled his criminal organization, unknown to him, he was being recorded the entire time. In fact, between 1961 and 65, the Cavalcante had been the main subject in the Goodfella tapes, a surveillance operation against the small but growing Jersey crime family. The feds bugged four spots across Jersey and Pennsylvania one of which was the Kenilworth Plumbing Supply Store, listening in on every conversation between the boss and his men. The other men targeted in the operation were Philadelphia crime boss Angelo Bruno and New York Genovese captain Gerardo Catena. The operation began following the testimonies of Joe Valacchi, a member of the Genovese crime family who'd flipped in 1963 and openly testified about the existence of Cosa Nostra, the first Italian gangster in history to do so. <laughs> Valaki's life of crime began when he would join a youth street gang named the Minutemen. These guys were known for their quick robberies that involved breaking down storefronts and grabbing whatever they could before the cops showed up. In 1921, a 17-year-old Valaki was arrested for grand larceny and two years later, during a failed robbery. He got a year and a half in New York's infamous Sing Sing Institution, but got out after half his sentence was over. He came home to Harlem only to find out his role as a getaway driver was now someone else's. He then began his own crew and by 1930 had a strongly established name in the underworld. That same year, Vlacki would become a made man, becoming a soldier under Gitano Rena. He also married in Torena's family in 1932. When Maranzano became the boss of all bosses, Vlacki became his bodyguard, and following his boss's assassination, became one of Charlie Luciano's top lieutenants, operating under family captain Tony Strollo. In 1959, Vlacki got a narcotics charge and received a 15-year-long sentence. 
In 62, he murdered another man behind bars. Another inmate he feared was going to murder him. He'd grown paranoid regarding his boss, Vito Genovese, whom he claimed had a contract on his life. He mistook another inmate for Joseph Di Palermo, the man who he believed was sent to kill him. Vlacky picked up a metal pipe. Shortly afterwards, he flipped and numerous anti-mafia campaigns began across the US. The wiretaps caught De Cavalcante discussing eight different murders with his associates. The first one he spoke about was the 1951 murder of Willie Moretti. Moretti was the underboss of the Genovese family, at the time known as the Luciano family. He was the cousin to family boss Frank Costello, and when Costello retired after being almost assassinated, became the underboss to Vito Genovese. However, by the early 50s, the once powerful and connected Moretti was suffering from an advanced state of syphilis, which was causing him to become irrational. Genovese wanted to put him out of his misery. On October 4, 1951, Moretti and four other gangsters sat down for lunch in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. They sat together and joked in Italian before one of the men brought up a pistol and shot Moretti in the face. De Cavalcante also spoke of the November 23, 1962 murder of Charles Cavallaro, a member of the Youngstown Mafia, who was killed by a hand grenade. It was part of a gang territory war, but the explosion had taken his 11-year-old son with him. De Cavalcante, as a man who often avoided the use of brutality, was openly opposed to both the deaths as he saw them as against Cosa Nostra principles. However, according to his recountings, Cavallaro's death had led to a new mafia ban on using grenades when murdering somebody. He spoke oftentimes on ways of getting rid of bodies, such as things like a garbage compactor. However, sticking to his diplomatic nature, he often avoided useless murders. He was approached to a a hit on a black construction worker who'd struck a mafioso's son with a shovel during a fight. Fearing a conflict with the nation of Islam, however, the Cavalcante said no. The tapes exposed a series of political scandals as well. In early 1965, the Cavalcante met with Bonanno associate Joseph Ziccarelli, a corruptive force from New York, to discuss the upcoming deportation of gangster Emmanuel Riggi and Ziccarelli would point him to Cornelius Gallagher, an American representative from New Jersey's 13th District. Ziccarelli told his fellow gangster that Gallagher could get the case dropped, which was great news. The feds caught the boss on tape talking with policemen, politicians, gangsters, and more, and they had a long list of damning information. One of the wiretaps at the Kenilworth store caught De Cavalcante expressing a sense of disillusionment he'd been facing with Cosa Nostra after Carlo Gambino didn't vote in his favor in the commission. Gambino had passed over De Cavalcante's family for membership into the commission and had instead appointed Joseph Colombo a chair. Colombo was the boss of the Colombo crime family and a very close man to Gambino. De Cavalcante was overheard talking with Majuri about how the decision had angered him. He said, quote, Columbo sits like a baby next to Carl all the time. He'll do anything Carl wants him to do. Sometimes, Frank, the more things you see, the more disillusioned you become. You know, honesty and honorability, those things. The feds listened closely as De Cavalcante and his associates spoke about wedding costs and argued over business. One wiretap behind a restaurant in Mountainside, New Jersey, the headquarters of Angelo De Carlo, a known gangster who was well respected in the underworld, caught the boss and his men reminiscing excitedly about a Jewish mobster they'd bludgeoned to death, as well as another gangster they'd gunned down in the woods. All of these conversations were caught, transcripted, and saved.
1966, Vastola and fellow mafioso Daniel Annunziata were sent by De Cavalcante to a loaded dice game at a motel in Trevos, Pennsylvania to stick the game up. The two men entered the room and proceeded to act as normal players before they feigned shock and anger at the fact that the dice were loaded. They pulled out firearms and demanded a settlement of 20 grand. The game operators decided to negotiate the terms of their settlement with the boss. Over the next six weeks, three meetings were held between the gamers, the robbers, and the cavalcante, who'd planned the entire thing. By the end of it all, a $12,000 settlement was negotiated, of which the boss got $3,800. On December 13, 1967, the Cavalcante and Bruno were arrested and put on trial for falsifying New Jersey driver's license applications. And in March of the following year, Vastola, Annunziata, and the Cavalcante were indicted for conspiracy to violate federal extortion statutes in a 17-month-long federal operation. The feds used the wiretaps to raid the Kenilworth storefront and found four illegal firearms. On July 18, the boss was arrested yet again for having a stolen 38 caliber in his possession, which the officers had found during the raid. He was put on trial for the Travos extortion scheme, but his lawyer, Sidney France Blau, began to inquire as to the legality of the wiretaps. On January 17, 1969, France Blau requested a discover motion, and he was provided the massive 2300 page transcript of the Goodfellow tapes. On June 10, the lawyer requested the release order for the tapes, and it was discovered that the wires had been planted without a court order allowing them. The multi-thousand pages worth of recordings could not be used as evidence. However, Franz Blau, a former USDA, had not requested that the files be disclosed only to the Defensive Council. As a result, the report was made public and it exposed numerous facets of mob life in the US. Franz Blau was then dismissed by his client and replaced with a different lawyer. The end of the Cavalcante's reign was approaching. On December 16, 1969, over 55 people were indicted by a grand jury, the boss included. The charges were regarding a $20 million interstate gambling ring operating out of Newark in Troy, New York. At the time, it was one of the country's largest gaming rackets, and on January 2nd, 1970, the Cavalcante was charged with gambling. Another trial began in April of 1970, but it was temporarily suspended after the boss became ill with bronchitis. The Cavalcante was brought back to court for the Trevos extortion case, and one of the victims in the plot testified against the boss, giving all the facts of the case. The government was now convinced of the Cavalcante's role in the plan. Meanwhile, the defense had no witness nor evidence to disprove it. The Cavalcante claimed that he was being framed and was nothing more than a mediator in an underworld quarrel, but no one bought it. On September 24, 1970, the boss of the De Cavalcante crime family was convicted on three counts of conspiracy, his very first ever conviction. He received 15 years behind bars, and he was angry about it. Vestola and Annunziata each got one count as well. It's now January of 1971. The Cavalcante is summoned to a secret court hearing in Newark. There, he decides to plead guilty to one charge of conspiracy. The trial wasn't immediately made public in order to protect the rights of the other defendants. On March 10 of that same year, the Cavalcante's case was reversed. Philadelphia Court of Appeals Judge Arlen Adams had reversed the ruling after a three-judge panel had decided that the Travos case didn't truly have sufficient evidence. Vastola and Annunziata were let go, but the Cavalcante was forced to stay behind. His gambling trial was coming up and the U.S. Attorney for New Jersey, Herbert Stern, didn't want the gangster out of prison. 
In March of 1971, De Cavalcante got five years and a 10k fine for his participation in the gambling ring, and on August 17, was also indicted yet again for the stolen 38 caliber the feds had seized three years prior. The boss of the De Cavalcante crime family was now sitting in the big house. While behind bars, De Cavalcante decided to spend his time by taking up work as a prison nurse, and his performance was praised by the prison's chief medical officer. The man stated that De Cavalcante, quote, has proven to be one of the best inmate nurses that I have had under my supervision in the three years that I have been there. He kept up his good behavior behind bars, and on December 20, 1973, was granted parole. It's now early 1974. The Cavalcante is speeding down Interstate 287 in his Cadillac before a state trooper would pull him over. He was doing 77 in a 55 zone and was charged. However, he was an ill man, suffering from bronchitis by this point, and had his case postponed twice. The third time he tried to appeal a postponement, the judge denied it after a state trooper had seen the Cavalcante out on the street performing fine. However, he never attended the hearing. In early 1976, a now 63-year-old De Cavalcante decided to move to South Florida, a region that the crime family had numerous operations in. He was planning on building a legitimate casino there, but when the state rejected legalized gambling, that idea was dropped. By 1980, the boss of the family opted to step down, officially retiring in 82. His role then went to De Cavalcante acting boss Giovanni Riggi, who would lead the organization into the new decade. It's 1980. The Cavalcante family boss, Simone de Cavalcante, appoints Giovanni Riggi to become the new family boss as the aging man retires. Riggi's appointment to the lead role made sense. Riggi was raised in the household of a de Cavalcante soldier. He at first led life as a normal citizen, although his father pressured him into joining the gang. After graduating high school as class president of 1942, Riggi joined the U.S. Army. Following the end of World War II, he came home and joined his dad in the Mafia. Riggi was a well-liked and well-spoken man who commanded a lot of respect and fear from the way he acted. Like the boss before him, he tried to be more diplomatic than not and avoided murder. Of course, he wasn't averse to it when he felt it a necessary step, however, but he was a peaceful and fatherly man more than anything. Unlike most other Mafia bosses, Riggi was the kind of man who was genuinely willing to take the fall for his crew and sit behind jail for them. On Sunday mornings, the entire crime family could be found hanging out at Riggi's coffee bar, the Café Italia, across from a social club, the Ribera. The Ribera was used to raise funds for poverty-stricken families back home in Sicily, something that made him one of the Cavalcante's favorites. On October 2nd, 1964, Riggi, who had been made beforehand, was promoted to the level of family captain, and by the mid-70s, had taken over almost all construction in the family's territory. He held an iron fist over the local unions, which he both bribed and extorted. He was an agent for the International Association of Laborers and Hood Carriers, and held a hand in numerous crime rackets like loan sharking and gambling. When De Cavalcante got his five-year-long stint in jail, Riggi was named acting boss. In 1978, Riggi okayed a hit on John Suarato, the uncle of Vinnie Palermo. Palermo, the nephew-in-law to De Cavalcante, will become important later. Suarato was a low-level member of the organization who spent most of his days hustling on the street. He'd been involved in a long-running dispute with his sister, and on the night of his murder, Palermo and his brother Patsy approached their uncle while he sat in his car. The men opened fire, killing him, and Riggi's name and the family would grow even further. 
In the early 80s, officers found the body of Vincenzo Sorcia under the Gothals Bridge in Elizabeth. Sorcia, a local contractor, had gotten into a fight with another gangster at the Ribera, and he had to go. After becoming boss, Reggie made a number of administrative changes to the family. For one, he reinstated the old traditions the mafiosi once practiced while making someone, including the burning of the holy card. Reggie also began pushing Majuri and Lorasso out of their roles. Reggie and Majuri were old rivals, and so, once he became boss, he demoted the man from consigliere, his role going to Stefano Vitabile. Vitabile had joined the organization back in the 70s as a soldier under Reggie, who would rise up over the next decade, becoming family consigliere in Majuri's place. Majuri ran his own crew until 1983, when he would pass away. His son Charles would continue to run the crew in his place. As for Lorasso, he saw a similar situation take shape. His power in the organization had been slowly declining since the series of indictments against the Cavalcante back in the 1960s and early 70s. And when Riggi took over, it was the final blow to the underboss. His role was given to Girolamo Palermo. Palermo was a long-established gangster who'd made his bones decades prior and would become a high-ranking member of the family's organization. It's September 13, 1960. This beautiful Alfonso Colicchio is standing behind the counter in his Elizabeth, New Jersey bar named Zini's Tavern. Palermo walks through the door with a few other men and they begin beating Colicchio hard. The bar owner fights back as Palermo pulls out a handgun and shoots the man to death. The job had been ordered by then boss Nick Del More who had grown angry with the bar owner. Only a few days prior, Colicchio had openly disrespected the boss, and this ultimately led to his death and Palermo's rise in the family. However, Palermo kept the murder quiet and under the radar, as Colicchio was Riggi's brother-in-law. In the late 1970s, Riggi had Palermo made, and in the early 80s, promoted to underboss. Lorasso was an angry man, but this entire thing was out of his control. This, however, would lead to problems later on. Riggi ran a massive union racket alongside Giacomo Amari and Giuseppe Schifelitti, high-ranking captains in the organization. Together, the men brought in millions. Meanwhile, he was a man who kept his mouth shut. He refused to ever say incriminating things, and as a result, Federal wiretaps could never actually catch him saying anything. He refused to speak with men over the phone, and according to some sources, was willing to travel long distances to use a payphone for short, simple conversations. When he was in public, he never showed himself to be a boss, and never did anything that could land him in jail. In one case, Riggi had called up a local contractor and told him to meet him at the dining space in the Linden Sheraton Hotel. The contractor called up the New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force, or the OCTF, and told them about the meeting. They bugged the table at the diner, and when Riggi showed up, the receptionist sat the men at that table. The OCTF sat outside the hotel, listening in on the wiretap. Riggi sat down with the contractor and told him that, quote, New Jersey is a very pro-union state. A group of union presidents in the restaurant overheard the conversation, walked over, and shook Riggi's hand. The men told the contractor how great Riggi was, and after the lunch meeting, the man began working with Riggi. Meanwhile, the crime boss knew very well that at some point in time, he'd have to go behind bars. And so, he began to prepare himself for that reality. He would oftentimes sit in empty rooms by himself for hours on end, every day, and began to work out as well. At some point in the mid-80s, Riggi had another gangster drive him to East Orange, where he knew a butcher shop owner. He'd saved the man's life in the past, but had never asked for anything in return. He asked the butcher for one simple request, in the event he went to jail, that the man feed his family. 
1986, Ritchie had himself promoted to become president of Union Council 30, as well as consultant to Local 394. He used this as A, a legitimate job, and B, to get an entry into the local labor unions, which became the family's most profitable racket. In 1988, however, things changed when John Gotti, the boss of the Gambino family, muscled his way into North Jersey. It's December 16, 1985. Gambino crime boss Paul Castellano is sitting in his 1985 Lincoln Town car alongside family underboss Thomas Bellotti. The two men are driving to meet with gang member Frank DeChico at Sparks Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan. The car pulls up by the restaurant entrance at around 5 p.m. Unknown to Castellano, however, six gunmen dressed in long Russian trench coats stood on both sides of the street. The gang leader stepped out of his vehicle with Bellotti when the gunmen appeared out of the dark and opened fire on the men, hitting them dozens of times. The spray of gunfire left the two dead on the street as the Russian-dressed hitmen ran off into the dark. Sitting across the street was a tinted car carrying John Gotti and his second-in-command, Sammy Gravano. In 1987, Vestola was arrested for the physical assault of a label record executive who refused his extortion attempt of the man's company. While in jail, Vestola met John Gotti, who, over time, had become convinced that the man was going to flip. Gotti tried getting Riggi to murder his guy, but the man refused. The new boss of the Gambinos then realized he'd have to exert more control if he wanted things to go his way. Vastola was convicted for the extortion attempt and got a massive, two-decade-long sentence. It's now January 4, 1988. The body of high-ranking the Cavalcante mafioso Vincent Rotondo is found slumped over in his bullet-riddled Lincoln Continental outside his home in Brooklyn. Rotondo was a big earner for the family and was heavily into union racketeering in Brooklyn. However, it was apparent that he wanted control of the organization, and as such, Reggie needed him gone. His son Anthony would take over his old crew, although he originally had plans to become a criminal defense lawyer. Meanwhile, John Gotti had become annoyed over the fact that the rival Genovese family had stronger connections in North Jersey, and he decided to show off his power. At Rotondo's funeral in Linden, New Jersey, the De Cavalcantes showed up alongside the Gambinos. Gaudi and Reggie were apparently friends, but he pulled Reggie aside to have a meeting in an alternate room. According to Anthony Rotondo, quote, when they came out, John Reggie was white as a sheet. John Gaudi told him the De Cavalcante family would now answer to him. Later that year, Gotti asked Richie for a massive favor. He wanted the boss to murder Fred Weiss, a private sanitation kingpin in New York. Weiss had recently purchased a large empty property in Staten Island alongside two mafiosi and had begun dumping huge amounts of toxic medical waste on the site. Staten Island authorities discovered the dumping scheme and opened an immediate investigation into Weiss, which made both Gaudi and Riggi nervous. The men were afraid Weiss would flip on them and become an informant since he was facing a large trial, and as such, he needed to go. Gaudi approached Riggi and asked if he could take care of it. Riggi, noticing an opportunity to get in good favor with their neighbors in New York, approached Rotondo and told him that since the boss of another family had asked the boss of their family for help, they had to, quote, get the job done at any cost. Rotondo began to set up a squad of hitmen. 
On September 11, 1989, Vinnie Palermo, his friend Anthony Capo, and a troop of 12 gangsters drove up to New York in a squad of four SUVs. They drove up to the apartment of Weiss's girlfriend from where he was going outside. He exited the building and began walking towards his car when Palermo and Capo approached him. The two men pulled out handguns and dropped Weiss where he stood. They would not only solidify their careers in the Mafia, but become made men as a result. The De Cavalcantes had done a big favor for a major New York boss, and it was looking good for them. However, the idea that the North Jersey family was nothing but a glorified satellite crew still persisted, and this bothered the gangsters greatly. They wanted to be a legitimate Mafia family, but no one saw them as one. Adding to their problems, the government would begin a series of major prosecutions at the turn of the decade that saw Riggi's administration going quiet for a while. Nonetheless, the family would enter the 90s under Riggi's leadership, and their legal issues mixed with their insecurities would bring a massive Bonnie count with them. It's October 16, 1989. The Cavalcante family boss, John Riggi, has become the main focus in a series of federal indictments regarding construction union racketeering in North Jersey. He, his sons, his underboss, Girolamo Palermo, and family soldier, Salvatore Timpani, are all charged with controlling Local 394. And on July 20, 1990, Riggi and Timpani were convicted for extortion. Palermo was acquitted while the family's boss, got 15 years behind bars. And with him unable to directly control the family by his own hand, a mutiny would begin to form yet again between the historically hostile Newark and Elizabeth factions of the organization, a battle that would result in bloodshed. Following his imprisonment, Riggi set up a new administration panel to run the organization, Vastola, who was facing his own charges, would become the family's acting boss. By this point in time, he was high enough on the organizational hierarchy and was essentially running the day-to-day -day rackets. So, his appointment made sense. Shortly afterwards, however, he got a massive extortion sentence of one decade and disappeared off the map. It was actually a good thing he'd left the scene, as unknown to him, New York Gambino boss John Gotti and his second-in-command Sammy Gravano had been planning Vastola's murder alongside Jersey capo John D'Amato. The early 90s were an interesting era for the North Jersey crew. The family still lived in the shadow of New York and were still under the iron fist of the Gambinos. Meanwhile, the growing aggression of the men in the organization had begun to tick up a body count as they tried to prove to the men up north that they were, in fact, a force to be feared. Following Riggi's imprisonment, a state of violent disarray would take the streets of North Jersey as men were getting gunned down left and right. D'Amato was one of many men in the family who'd been conspiring to murder others above him for the Gambinos. And when Vestola went away, Riggi made D'Amato his new acting boss. D'Amato, who'd become an Elizabeth Capo in the prior decade, held a large hand over the family's labor rackets, working alongside Girolamo Palermo, while he also earned through numerous gambling operations with men like Charles Maggiore and Gaetano Vastola. When D'Amato became boss, however, it began to become increasingly clear where his loyalties lied. He was a noticeable puppet of Gaudi's family, willing to sabotage his own men for New York's favor. As insecure as the Jersey mob was regarding the place in the mafia hierarchy, this was a Step no two and a mutiny Is against quietly four against the new boss. The first signs of D'Amato's sabotage showed themselves in 1991 when Louis Larasso, one of the family's original administrative men, went missing. 
D'Amato began to fear that Lorasso had become a potential rival of his, and that the demoted underboss was planning on turning Charles Majuri against him. As a result, he needed to go. On November 11, 1991, Lorasso went shopping with his wife. His 65th birthday was coming up, and following the trip, the couple went to their daughter's home to eat dinner. Right after dinner, Lorasso got up and said he had to go somewhere. He never specified where, however, as he got into his wife's car and sped off. He was never seen again. Stefano Vitabile, the family's longtime conciliar, was secretly running the show in the background, unknown to his men and his new acting boss. He'd been part of the plot against Lorasso's life and wanted to quietly control the organization without public knowledge. He himself had been conspiring against many members of the family who he saw as potential threats. And when Lorasso left the picture, D'Amato was next. It's late 1991. The De Cavalcante family is currently in a state of conflict and violence. Men are dying left and right as the organization begins to turn on their acting boss, John D'Amato, whom they begin to see as a puppet to the New York Gambino family. Meanwhile, Vitabile continues to run things behind closed curtains. <laughs> Anthony Rotondo is sitting with D'Amato's girlfriend, whom he himself was actively seeing as well. She'd recently just gotten out of a heated argument with her man, one of many, and out of anger, revealed some damning information to Rotondo. D'Amato, his boss, was a homosexual. She revealed that D'Amato had been actively going to swinger clubs in Manhattan, where he partook in large sex parties and cheated on her with men. And this information shocked the Capo regime. Rotondo almost immediately began sharing the secret, which reached family captain Anthony Capo. Capo went to the family administration, conciliere Stefano Vitabile and underboss Giacomo Amari, and revealed this secret information to them. Vitabile, who wanted D'Amato gone, was happy with what he'd heard. He knew it could be used as a perfect justification for D'Amato's potential murder, since under any other circumstance, John Gotti wouldn't have accepted it. The conciliere went to visit Riggi at the Federal Correctional Complex in Butler and told him everything. The gangsters were afraid having a gay boss would make the already rejected organization seem even more inferior to their associates in New York. A stigma in the mob that would desecrate any sort of perception they had left. This, coupled with their dislike of D'Amato, spelt doom. D'Amato was now on the chopping block, and the men chosen to plan out the job were Vinnie Palermo and Anthony Capo. It's June 4, 1944. <laughs> Vinnie Palermo was born into an Italian-American family, growing up in Brooklyn, New York. As a young man, Palermo would become an altar boy in his local church, but in 1960, at the age of 16, lost his father. His mother had severe asthma that made it difficult for her to leave the house, and so Palermo got a job at the Fulton Fish Market in New York. This later got him the nickname Vinnie Ocean, which the other gangsters would refer to him as. In 1965, a 21-year-old Palermo would marry into the family of Nick Dillmore, who'd passed away a year prior, when he married the niece of Simone de Cavalcante. De Cavalcante liked Palermo and as a result, began bringing the young man around to the Kenilworth Plumbing Store, where he made the acquaintance of numerous de Cavalcante gangsters. This got him a strong entry into the family, and he began operating a profitable, loan-sharking racket with the Capo and the Gambino family. He was a cutthroat man who allegedly had a keen eye for the weaknesses and fears of others. And around other gangsters, he spoke very little. By keeping away from gang social clubs and never saying anything incriminating, Palermo was arrested only once across his career for lifting shrimp from the market he worked at. In 1977, Palermo was made. Eventually, however, he divorced his first wife and remarried, although continued to show love for his first family. 
By the 1980s, Palermo was a wealthy man. He owned a large mansion on the waterfront in Island Park, Long Island, which also constituted the surrounding property and a 100-foot pier. Of course, his income was illegal, and Palermo needed a way to legitimize his money, which led him to Wiggles. Wiggles was a popular strip club on Queens Boulevard that the gangster used as his source of legitimate income. With a large family, larger home, and lewd business to his name, Palermo was a happy man, but his career would only skyrocket in 1989, when he clipped Fred Weiss. Palermo had done the job alongside fellow gangster Anthony Capo, and the two men would become high-ranking gangsters from there on. It's 1959. Anthony Capo was born into an Italian family in Staten Island, New York. After graduating from high school, Capo would begin studying to become a certified asbestos abatement worker. However, he didn't care much for his classes and got the school operator to even take his final test on his behalf. He, as a result, knew nothing about asbestos removal. By the end of the 1980s, Capo was officially recognized by law enforcement as a member of John Riggi's De Cavalcante organization. A resident of New York, Capo worked under Capo regime Vincent Rotondo, and later his son Anthony Rotondo, to run numerous gambling, drug, extortion, and loan sharking rackets in North Jersey and Brooklyn. As time went on, he got his own branch crew in New York, which made him millions. Meanwhile, he was running an eight year long loan sharking operation with Joseph Watts, a high ranking German Italian associate of the Gambino family, and between 86 and 90 the scheme grossed over 12 million dollars. Known to be a raging coke addict and violent man, Capo was the kind of gangster sent when the bosses wanted to have someone dealt with violently. He enjoyed hurting others in any means he could, knives, guns, fists, and grew reputation by proudly sharing his stories to his associates. In one wiretapped conversation, Capo was caught bragging about a man he'd attacked after owing him money. He explained how the gangster in question walked into his bar and yelled to get his money back. I pat myself on the back. I hit him good. He didn't die. I beat him. I cut him. I chopped him up so bad. Then I stick him in the car. Capo proceeded to call the man's brother and explain what he'd done in vivid detail. In 1990, Capo was made by John D'Amato following the murder of Fred Weiss. It's now January of 1992. The higher-ups of the De Cavalcante family are planning a secret plot to whack out and replace their boss, John D'Amato. A combination of reasons, including his loyalty to New York over New Jersey and his sexual deviance, have led them to a point of no return. Since the early beginnings of the established American Cosa Nostra, the law when it came to getting rid of a boss had always been to approach the commission and get approval from every boss on the panel. However, they felt it was best to keep the embarrassment hidden, especially from John Gotti, and simply murder the boss in secret. Meanwhile, D'Amato had recently flown back to New York from Florida and had gone to see his girlfriend in Mill Basin, Brooklyn. While at her place, he got a call from Capo, who offered to take the boss to lunch in the city. D'Amato accepted, and after leaving, walked a block down the road. There, Capo and fellow gangster Victor DiChiara drove up to D'Amato in DiChiara's car. He got into the back seat and told the men, let's go eat. As the Chiara began to push the gas pedal, however, Capo, who was sitting in the passenger seat, turned around to face D'Amato. He was holding a handgun. D'Amato yelled, oh sh as Capo fired twice on him. His body was driven to a safe house where he and Rotondo dropped it off for some other men to dispose of it. On the body, they found five grand and gave it to the Chiara as compensation for his now blood-stained car. In the preceding investigation, police were able to discover the car and found D'Amato's blood all over the back seat. However, they never found the body and D'Amato was reported missing. With him gone, the role of the boss went to acting underboss Gioacchino Amari. It's 
It's March 14, 1945. Gioacchino Amari is born in Ribera, Sicily. He became a mafioso early on, but at some point in his life, Amari would murder a cop in Corleone. Corleone at this time was controlled by Michele Navarra, a ruthless mafia leader who had risen to the top after taking over the city. After committing the crime, Amari would flee to the US, where his real story begins. With time and a valuable reputation in hand, Amari would become a captain under the De Cavalcante family, and he established himself as an intimidating and high-earning member of the organization. When John D'Amato took charge, Amari became very close with Stefano Vitabile, who as stated earlier, was essentially running things behind the scenes. Although D'Amato would be the one to promote Amari to acting underboss following Lorasso's murder, his association with Vitabile would preserve his position following D'Amato's subsequent murder. Under D'Amato, Amari would make more money than ever before. He ran essentially every construction racket under the organization and became a consultant to Local 394, the mafia-controlled labor union in the area. However, when Anthony Rotondo shared D'Amato's secret pastime to the other gangsters, it was Amari and Vitabile who called for his murder and had the plan set up. Of course, it was a plot concocted across the entire organization, with many gangsters like Wall Street criminal Philip Abramo taking part as well. By the time it was over and the gun smoke had cleared, it was decided that Amari would become the new boss of the family. Amari and Vitabile were now working together to run the organization into the new decade. At some point in the mid-90s, a conflict formed between Amari and two of the families in New York, the Gambinos and the Colombos. By this point in time, the Colombo organization was recovering from their brutal Third Civil War, with their boss in prison for life. While the Gambinos were recovering from the fall of John Gotti's reign at the hand of underboss-turned-rat Sammy Gravano. The De Cavalcantes had recruited Louis Consalvo and Gregory Rago, gangsters from New York who couldn't be made in the city for membership in North Jersey. This in itself wasn't an issue. What was an issue, however, was that the two men had begun operating a profitable social club on Mott Street in New York, as well as a number of rackets in Manhattan. Their kick, of course, went up to Amari, and this bothered the men north of Jersey. Vitabile and Amari represented their family, while the Columbos sent acting conciliere Vinny Aloy. The Gambinos had their street boss, Nick Carozzo, and the men began to discuss the best way to peacefully settle their dispute. Everyone wanted a piece of the puzzle, but as the New Yorkers argued, since Rago and Conselvo operated in a gang-controlled area, their kicks should go up to those respective gangs. The issue was put to rest, however, when the men agreed on a new rule. The De Cavalcantes could only make men from Jersey and South Philly. That meant no more New York rejects in the organization. However, just as things seemed like they were going good, Amari would make a shocking discovery. He was dying of stomach cancer. It's 1995. The Cavalcante family acting boss, Gioacchino Amari, has just been diagnosed with stomach cancer and doesn't have much time left to live. His conciliere, Stefano Vitabile, approaches him with an idea to set up a ruling panel system of three high ranking mafiosi who could help him enforce his word in the street. The idea passes through Riggi, who accepts it, and a partnership of three gangsters is created Girolamo Palermo, Charles Maggiore, and Vinnie Palermo. Meanwhile, Palermo himself was facing some legal issues with his business, the Wiggle Strip Club. The city of New York had begun a crackdown on lewd businesses in the city that were within a certain distance of family zones, like schools and churches. A study conducted by the city government had concluded that adult businesses brought violent crime and unsafe characters into those areas, and so it was decided that any business of the sort within 500 meters of a school or church had to shut down and move. Wiggles was one of those businesses. 
However, the law had become heavily contested and challenged by the owners of such institutions, as they argued that adult services were simply an extension of the First Amendment to free speech. As such, in 1995, a proposal was developed that would keep both sides happy, known as the 60-40 rule. This rule made it so that any adult business within that set range could legally remain open if it was only 40% or less of an adult business. As such, Palermo had the place 60% empty at all times, and his legal cash flow remained active. Meanwhile, in 1996, Abramo began facing some legal issues of his own when he was arrested for defrauding over 300 people through his illicit businesses on Wall Street. Although not a captain, Abramo was a made man who was known as the King of Wall Street due to his operations there. He sold fraudulent stocks and controlled small cap brokerages, however, he was now facing a major charge for a massive $1 million credit scam, but his trial never concluded in an actual sentence. Amari's condition was worsening, and by 1997, it got to a point of no return. While lying in bed in the hospital, a 52-year-old Amari succumbed to his illness and died of stomach cancer on June 14, leaving a power vacuum in the family. Suddenly, everyone wanted a piece of the pot, and no one knew who truly was the boss. Vitabile would force himself in and institutionalize the three-man panel as the now official system of the De Cavalcante family, a unique idea that hadn't been proposed in other families in the past. The organization now had a three-headed mob boss. The idea behind this system was to keep things afloat and stable in North Jersey until they could find the right man to run the organization. Vitabile would mediate between the three captains as a sort of checks and balances system. It was supposed to be a civil alternative, but of course, as expected, it wasn't. By this point in time, the organized crime scene on the East Coast had changed dramatically. The Patriarcha family of Boston and Rhode Island had become the victim to numerous aggressive RICO trials following their civil war in the early 90s, and they were smaller and broker than ever. Meanwhile, the guys in New York were seeing their own downfall that had begun in the early 90s, as men were getting arrested left and right. They weren't able to exercise their power over regional organizations like they once could. But the De Cavalcantes of North Jersey weren't suffering that badly, and this gave them a newfound confidence they'd never had prior. The New Jersey crew had always been seen as a shadow of New York, nothing more than their former cousins down south. Decades of insecurity as a result of this had led to a wave of violence. But with New York trying to go silent, the De Cavalcantes had found an opportunity to apply themselves and rise up. They had hands in numerous rackets and were known well in their communities. While other criminals in the country were struggling with their mortgages and debt payments, and most of the regional families like in Denver and St. Louis had been essentially wiped out, the Jersey mob was bringing in millions from all kinds of illegal and legal sources. They were doing good, that is, until January 14, 1998. It's the early morning of January 14, 1998. Three men walk into the ground floor of the North Tower in New York. The men, in their 40s, were Richie Gillette, Melvin Folk, and Mike Reed of Brooklyn. As they walked past the crowd of employees coming for their early morning shifts, the three criminals, secretly armed with pistols, entered the elevator and traveled up to the 11th floor. There, they patiently waited outside the Bank of America Currency Exchange Office. Meanwhile, outside, an armored Brinks truck drives up at the entrance to the tower and stops. Two security guards exit the truck and bring out 3.2 million in bags of money, half of which was in foreign currency, which they then load up and bring into a freight elevator. The elevator stops at floor 11 where the currency exchange was, and the three criminals immediately spring into action. They hold the guards at gunpoint, tie them up, and load the money into their duffel bags. They sent the elevator up to a construction floor as they themselves took the passenger. They got down to the ground floor, exited the elevator, 
and, unknown to them, took their masks off in full view of a security camera. In fact, they looked directly into it as they left the tower with only half of what they assumed were American dollar bills. Within a few hours, the men's photos were released to the press, and the police put out an APB on the gangsters. They hailed from Windsor Terrace, a mafia-controlled neighborhood where they were allegedly strongly disliked by the other locals. With a massive $25,000 reward for turning them in to sweeten the pot, it wasn't long before officers caught up to the men. Within two days following the robbery, Folk and Reed were caught and booked, but Gillette was nowhere to be seen. It's now a few days following the heist. A DEA officer is making his rounds on a large passenger train traveling through Albuquerque, New Mexico. Its final destination is in California, but due to the large number of drugs being moved through the trains at the time, a new security system had been set into place. An officer walked to the booth of a messy, tired-looking man dressed in a Green Bay Packers jacket. The man had a bag with him, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The agent continued through the train as it came to a stop in Albuquerque before realizing he'd just been questioning the final missing suspect in the Bank of America robbery. After running back to Gillette's seat, the man was already gone, now on the run in New Mexico. Officers began searching the streets, looking for their suspect. He'd been traveling through crowded city zones and establishments to hide in the crowd. However, the police quickly received a call from Famous Sam's, a local bar, where a bartender tells them that Gillette is sitting right across from him. Unknown to the fugitive that the police are coming right to his location, he gets up and goes to the toilet. Police walk in, but the man isn't there. No one had seen him enter the can, and so, they'd all assumed he'd left the bar. Officers exit the place and leave, as Gillette finishes his business in the bathroom. Gillette went back to the motel he was staying at, the Knights Inn, while two officers positioned themselves around the building. One stayed out in the lot, while the other officer began to question the receptionist. Gillette, exiting the place, walked past the man, not wearing his sports merch as he stepped outside. Although the officer at the desk didn't instantly recognize him, within an instant the officer outside tackled Gillette to the ground and had him in cuffs. They found a bag of cash and the infamous Green Bay jacket in his room. FBI agents began a deeper investigation into the robbery and came to the conclusion that these three men couldn't have acted alone and that there was someone else involved in the plot. Enter the Cavalcante associate, Ralph Guarino. Ralph Guarino was an interesting gangster. He was a smaller man who stood out among the men around him. He focused well on his looks and the way he dressed, and wasn't really a fighter or a street thug. Rather, his specialty was theft. Guarino loved to plan schemes and carry them out, such as a series of underground illegal gas stations that he operated in New York City. Following the American bank robbery, police connected Guarino to the plot. He'd met up with a Trade Center employee named Salvatore Calciano, who'd provided the gangster with an employee badge from one of his friends. He revealed the day and time of the Brink's delivery, and both men worked together to set up and carry out the plot. News of the plot being exposed had never really reached the men in North Jersey, and as such, they didn't know what was going on. Guarino himself wanted to get rid of his cut of the money so as to not be caught with it, but it was too late. Not even 10 days following the plot, police showed up at the man's door and took him in. They told the gangster about the charges he was facing and managed to coax him into wiring up and becoming a rat against the organization. They made him wear a listening device and began listening. What the FBI heard was worrying. A civil war was brewing in North Jersey between two high-level men, Charles Majuri and Vinnie Palermo. 
Both capos were on the family's ruling panel, and both were rivals who wanted control. It was discovered that Majuri, who was enraged at the prospect of not being the family's boss, was forming a plot to murder his rival, and so, the co-boss went to his soldier, James Gallo. However, Majuri was a man with few friends and many enemies. Since becoming boss in prior two, Majuri had exerted control over his fellow gangsters by firing many of them from the union he led. And so, Gallo went to Palermo and exposed the plot. Palermo decided to take some time to strike first, while Gallo drew out Majuri's. Meanwhile, Guarino continued to collect info on the street. The feds provided him with the load of secretly bugged phones, which he was supposed to pose as bootlegged untraceable mobile devices. He approached some of the guys out near Sacco's meat market, a pork shop in Elizabeth, where the gangsters operated, and provided them with the devices. One of the men who got a phone was his driver, Joey Masella. <laughs> Masella was born all the way back in 1948 to an immigrant family in Brooklyn. Growing up on the same block as men like Palermo, D'Amato, and Majuri, he became involved in criminal activity early on. Masella lost his father Alex Masella when he was young, when his father was electrocuted while working on the railroad. The young gangster was left to be raised by his reportedly mentally abusive mother. As Palermo showed a strong initiative and rose up in the mob, he took Masella as a sort of protege, since the men were good friends. He gave Masella a small crew of guys like Capo and Gallo, and he ran a large-scale gambling franchise. The money from his racket, plus his role as Palermo's bodyguard, kept his position high in the organization. However, as the years progressed, Masella proved himself to be a complete incompetent. After his marriage, Masella moved to Staten Island to live with his wife, but he quickly began to develop a gambling addiction. He ran his own racket into the ground and was forced into a situation where he was losing more than he was making. He had gone from the high life to a man who spent all day driving down the road thinking of how to make money. With no real business in play and a gambling debt bigger than Staten Island, Masella was forced to spend all day hustling while borrowing from family loan sharks. He grew more fearful with time since he couldn't pay anybody back. And so, he spent most of his day at home afraid of what could happen to him on the outside. By the late 90s, Masella had mounted a debt of 450 grand. He drove Garino around as he spoke about money problems and potential ways to earn with him. The FBI listened in as the two spent practically all day talking about business, but Palermo, who'd grown tired of Masella's behaviors, would give him a new opportunity that would take the shape of a Charles Majuri. Palermo, fearful that Majuri was coming for his head, decided to act first and organized a hit crew comprised of Masella, Capo, and Gallo. The three men drove out to Majuri's home in Linden and parked across the street without a real plan. They were simply waiting for him to exit the place where he lived with his mother, and from there, they would come up with something. However, the hours went by with no sign of Majuri. They got annoyed and tired before looking almost right next to where they were parked and noticed a state trooper's car. Majuri's neighbor was an officer, and a nervous Masella decided to ultimately give up on the plot and drive off. Masella, fearful of what he'd done, flew down to Florida as things cooled down in Jersey. There, he would call Palermo and tell him that he wasn't going through with it. His chance to elevate his position, do good by Palermo, and become a made man were now all down the drain, while Palermo reconsidered his position with his rival. The boss decided that at the end of the day, the rather unfavorable Majuri wasn't a real threat to him, as he himself had the captains behind him. Although there was a three-man panel in charge of the family, Palermo was essentially the sole leading factor out on the street, and the hit job was dropped ending the potential civil war. He also reconsidered his position with Masella, who had become such a major embarrassment to the Jersey gangsters that something drastic had to be done about him. Masella finally returned home, only to walk into his inevitable doom. It's now October 10 of 1998. 
Masella gets a call from a mafia bookmaker named Steve. Steve was in debt to Masella, and he told the gangster over the phone that he had some 10 large ready for him, giving him a meeting spot. Masella gets in his car and drives down to the location, only to find no one there. He receives another call from the indebted man, saying to meet him at another location. Masella then travels up to Brooklyn, New York, stopping the parking lot of the Diker Beach Golf Course, where Steve said he'd meet him. As Masella sat in his car, however, a familiar face approached him, that a fellow gangster, Anthony Greco. Greco was standing among numerous other men, and it finally set into Masella what was going on. Greco told him, quote, You know what's about to happen, right? As he raised his handgun and popped Masella in the head. The gangster was rushed down to the hospital shortly afterwards, but by that point, it was too late. Masella's story was over, and Guarino's story had hit a dead end. Meanwhile, Capo's anger issues had gotten him into some hot water when he aggressively stabbed a Gambino associate in Staten Island. The day of the incident, Capo had been flirting with a girl at a bar in New York when the associate, a man known as Remy, interrupted him to speak with him. Capo told Remy off, leading to Remy insulting him back. An angry Capo then pulled out a knife and stuck Remy in the face, striking his eye in a bloody scene. Eventually, with Masella's death, restructuring had to take place. Palermo was trying to make the De Cavalcantes a true mafia organization, and big changes needed to be made. Guarino was then given to Joseph Tinier Sclafani, an old school mafioso. Sclafani had been a World War II veteran and a strongly disciplined man when it came to fitness. He was a tough and aggressive man. And using that reputation, Sclafani returned home to New York and began to do work for the De Cavalcante crime family. He became a loan shark on the street while making a side income lifting and selling stolen merchandise. His gang did warehouse robberies as well as simple on the street ones. And he often bragged about the mink fur coats he used to steal off of rich women in broad daylight. In 1982, the aging Sclafani, now an experienced hitman, was officially made, becoming John D'Amato's bodyguard and driver. Irregardless, even with 20 plus deaths over his belt, he didn't go very far in the family, even as he got older. Although he hoped to become a capo, he was instead forced to stay a soldier, as the role went to Joseph Giacobbe, a forgetful man much older than him. He often shared his grievances with Garino, whom he saw as a new friend, and he was excited at the prospect of Garino getting made. Although he himself was down on his luck when it came to cash, like Masella, he continually discussed creative new ways to earn with his wiretapped partner. Guarino continued to discuss business with Sclafani, as the gangsters continued using the wiretapped phones he'd given them. Nonetheless, things in Jersey pushed on, as the FBI continued trying to mount a case against the organization. Palermo was making more money than ever, and with a readily violent crew under him, men pushing his force into the streets, new recruits every day, and New York backing off a little, things seemed to be running well for the De Cavalcante crime family. However, within only a few months, things would take a sharp turn downwards that would decimate the organization for good. You all right? My leg is broken. The bounce coming through. So you had coffee. Right. It's January 10, 1999. People all over America are sitting at the television to watch the premiere episode of the new crime drama series, The Sopranos. The show followed the life of North Jersey crime boss Tony Soprano as he leads his family, the DeMeo family, into the new century. Among the people watching are members of the actual North Jersey, the Cavalcante family. Later that day, the men discussed the show with confusion over the phone. The mobile phones they spoke over were provided to them by secret informant Ralph Guarino, and he had convinced the men that the devices were untraceable and bootlegged. 
In fact, they'd been speaking over the phones for months on end by this point. The men talked about the series and the weirdly similar things it had with their own lives. Joe Sclafani, talking with Anthony Rotondo, said, hey, What's this f***ing thing, Soprano? What the f*** is it? You never watched it? That's the f***ing you're in there. Yeah. What'd they say? Every word they said was recorded on FBI wiretaps and printed into transcripts. Guarino and Sclafani had been speaking for some time, and he'd learned a lot about his new friend. Sclafani was an openly violent man who often bragged about the number of men he'd buried, somewhere around 20. Using his reputation on the street, Sclafani built a profitable extortion career, but he wasn't earning enough to really elevate his position in the family. And by the time Guarino had been moved to his crew, the man was down on his financial luck. Sclafani, however, liked Guarino, and the two men slowly became good friends. As a result of this, he began to open up more and more and say more risky things in their conversations, things Guarino was able to catch on tape. They don't know where the body is, but one guy. Somebody digs a hole first, and that's the guy that takes it. He just dumps it in and covers it. The man in question Sclafani was referring to was later discovered to be Philip Lamella, who owned a large property in the upstate where he hid all the murder scenes. In one conversation, Sclafani talked about a hit job he was planning and told Guarino about how he wanted the job to be done on a motorcycle, of course, for cinematic value. However, he didn't have a cycle, nor did he know how to drive one. And so, he and his wiretap partner went on and on, back and forth, trying to plan a murder by motorcycle. Speaking of cinematic value, The Sopranos continued to captivate the gangsters. In years past, the De Cavalcante organization had been seen as nothing more than a group of Italian rednecks with a minor scale hustle. They'd always been forced under the iron hand of the New York Commission, with the Gambino family taking charge of North Jersey in the late 1980s. However, by the late 90s, New York had suffered from so many massive RICO prosecutions that they were forced to back off of North Jersey. The five families still had branches out there, but they were just that. Meanwhile, the North Jersey family had become more violent and more profitable than ever, the men at the top bringing in millions. They led quiet suburban lives, many of them owning large luxurious homes and holding traditional blue-collar work. In fact, the guys in New York would often joke about their associates in Jersey, making comments about how they all held legitimate 9-to-5s. However, the gangsters had secret double lives that were hidden from the normal Americans around them. But now, things were different. The De Cavalcantes were now the focus of the media world, a spot once almost solely allotted to New York. People were talking about them, and in a strange show of life imitating art, the men began to take on the styles and personalities of their screen counterparts. They spent their days watching and raving about the show while hanging out at Sacco's Meat Market, only a few blocks away from the fictional Satrial's Meat Market, the gang hangout in The Sopranos. The gangsters would liken themselves to the men on screen, with one guy noting over the phone that the Soprano family even had a topless bar, like the one owned by family boss Vinnie Palermo. The country was talking about them, and they were finally gaining notoriety for their work. As the North Jersey gangsters spent their days watching The Sopranos, things in the region continued on. The organization had seen some major changes take place since the end of the short civil war between warring bosses Charles Maggiore and Vinnie Palermo. 
The two men had been a part of the gang's three-man leadership panel, established by longtime conciliere Stefano Vitabile years prior. However, as expected, the two men quickly became enemies. The war quickly ended, however, with practically no deaths, as Palermo came out on top. Meanwhile, Maggiore went back to being a street captain, while Girolamo Palermo was demoted to the role of underboss, making Vinnie Palermo the sole authority in the region. The gangsters also began to sniff out the rats and undercover cops in the family. Although things were going good in Jersey, with little open law enforcement attention on the men, they knew things were going on behind the scenes. Palermo himself began to suspect that something was off about Ralph Guarino. He'd only been an informant for a little over a year by now, but the boss had grown suspicious of him. He wanted Guarino dead, but he needed proof before he made a move. Meanwhile, an opportunity to make Guarino had presented itself right to Sclafani's front door in the form of Frank D'Amato, the brother of murdered boss John D'Amato. D'Amato had been killed back in 92 for a number of reasons, namely his allegiance to New York and his sexual deviance, which had been exposed by his girlfriend. However, with him gone, his brother had become a target of the now power-hungry Palermo. He gave the job to his underboss Girolamo Palermo and his conciliere Stefano Vitabile and had them work with longtime mafioso Francesco Polizzi. Polizzi, born all the way back in 1936, was an old school figure. He was recognized as a family soldier in the late 50s under then boss Nick Delmore. He worked under Sam de Cavalcante, the future boss of the organization, and was heavily involved in the regional narcotics trade. When de Cavalcante became boss, however, he had John Riggi take over his old crew, not Polizzi. Polizzi continued operating in numerous mafia rackets, remaining a family soldier. He was never a highly recognized name in the media or to law enforcement. As the 70s rolled around, with Riggi slowly taking charge of the organization, Polizzi's drug empire continued to grow, with him focusing mainly on heroin and cocaine. He worked with family member Joseph Ganchi, both men based out of De Cavalcante's old Newark crew. Polizzi finally saw a massive career promotion in the early 80s, when De Cavalcante officially retired. Riggi became the new family boss, leaving the role of the Newark captain vacant. Polizzi rose up and took charge of the crew, and he ran his operations from Ganchi's Pizza Restaurant. Near the beginning of 1985, however, Polizzi's career took a sharp turn downwards when the feds began targeting the international Italian drug trade known by the moniker the Pizza Connection. The Connection was a nine-year-long crime operation that saw the arrival of almost two billion dollars worth of heroin to the US. Polizzi held a role in the connection and as a result was brought to court. The feds brought his wife to the witness stand to give testimony regarding one surveillance scene in which Polizzi was caught picking up a duffel bag from another gangster. She tried backing her husband's claims that the bag was filled with sardines that she needed to make him pasta, but no one believed her. On March 2nd, 1987, Polizzi and 21 other co-defendants got two decades behind bars and he went silent for a while. On April 3rd, 1995, Polizzi walked out of jail. He was suffering from a severe case of lung cancer, and the prison medic stated that he only had six months left to live. As a result, the judge decided to let him out early. Polizzi returned to North Jersey and was back on the street almost immediately. He had his old crew back, his old operations minus the drugs, and was earning yet again. When Polizzi went back to work, the family administration decided to elevate his role, seeing as he was a highly experienced and respected old school gangster, 
And so, they let him join Amari's inner circle. And he worked heavily alongside gangsters like Giuseppe Schifolitti and Vinny Palermo. Following the family civil war, the leaders of the organization's Newark faction, namely Majuri, were kicked out of Elizabeth and pushed back to Newark. Polizzi, although a high-level member of the Newark faction, was close to Palermo and Vitabile, and they allowed him to remain in the family's administration. That now brings us back to the Frank D'Amato murder plot. Palermo wanted D'Amato gone, as the man was a clear threat to his regime. D'Amato was angry over his brother's death, and openly vowed revenge against his new boss. However, he wasn't really a strong candidate, and his plan to fight back had been silenced over the years. Now, however, with Palermo as boss, things were different. Scalfani was excited at the prospect of having Gorino do the job, as it would make him a candidate for official membership into the family. He proposed that Gorino be given the contract and be made following, and when the feds realized what was about to go down, they figured that it was finally time to pull their informant off the street. Gorino stopped answering his phone calls, and no one knew where he'd gone. Meanwhile, the feds began to prepare a heavy case against the organization, and things in Jersey would go back to normal for the next few months. It's now December 2nd, 1999. Police sirens ring throughout the streets of Newark and Elizabeth as police begin going door to door with arrest warrants. Of the men captured are Palermo, Capo, Sclafani, Abramo, Vitabile, Rotondo, and Schifolitti. Over the next few hours, police raid numerous mob hangouts, homes, and locations. And by the end of it all, over 40 men are in cuffs. When they entered Palermo's home, the officers had found a suitcase full of clothing and personal belongings, and it was clear the boss was trying to lament, but it was too late. As it turns out, just before the arrests, Palermo had called up Anthony Rotondo and told the capo that he was going on the run and wanted the man to join him. However, since Palermo knew that indictments were coming, Rotondo feared that Palermo suspected him of being the informant who'd given the police the in to arrest the men. He gave the excuse that he couldn't leave his wife behind. However, in reality, he didn't trust Palermo and feared that if he went with him, he'd never see Jersey again. By the end of the raid, authorities had arrested virtually the entire organization. Anthony Capo, by this point in time, was still nothing more than a soldier in the family and now facing life in prison. He almost immediately flipped and began regurgitating as much info as he could come up with. The gangsters were brought forward and called to trial, and it was there Palermo learned the actual severity of his situation. He was facing life and possibly capital punishment. The gang boss took some time to reevaluate his situation. He was a successful man, with a large, loving family, a big, beautiful home, a perfectly legal business he loved possibly even more than his actual career as a criminal, but was now going to lose all of it and spend the rest of his life in a jumpsuit, sleeping in a cage, on a thin old mattress. And so, in 2000, Vinnie Palermo, the boss of the Decavalcante Mafia family, decided to make the ultimate decision and flip to the state. After flipping, Palermo admitted to his role in the murder or potential murders of Weiss, Lorasso, the D'Amato brothers, Majuri, Masella, and even his strip club manager, Tom Salvada. He explained all the plots in their entirety and revealed the roles of his co-conspirators. When word of his treachery got wind to the other gangsters in the organization, a domino effect took shape. Suddenly, everyone and their mother wanted to cut a deal and get out of jail free. And that's exactly what happened. In 2001, Rotondo flipped, and following him, Frank Scarabino, one of Fred Weiss's murderers. 
According to Scarabino, he'd been ordered to murder the families of Rotondo and Capo, an old school idea taken from Sicily and proposed by Polizzi. Scarabino was also facing charges for the murders of Daniel Annunziata, Weiss, Larasso, and the attempted murder of Vastola by John D'Amato. These things collectively pushed him to testify. Following him, Victor De Chiara, one of John D'Amato's killers, would flip as well. Anthony Greco, one of Joe Masella's killers, was caught in Pahrump, New York, and ultimately decided to flip. Following Palermo's flipping, John Riggi set up a new three-man panel to run the organization, this time of Girolamo Palermo, Stefano Vitabile, and Giuseppe Schifelitti. Made man and family loan shark Joe Miranda became Palermo's new acting underboss. Miranda was an old-school man, being a World War II veteran and had held a reputation spanning decades. He was a very close associate to De Cavalcante and later Riggi, and was now the family's underboss. Meanwhile, Polizzi's cancer had grown worse and worse. On Christmas Eve of 2001, he passed from lung cancer. In 2001, Sclafani pleaded guilty to loan sharking, extortion, and illegal gambling. His lawyer made it clear that the old-school gangster would, quote, not cooperate with anybody about anything. He received an 8-10 to 10 year long sentence, and that same year, Scifoliti was held under house arrest while awaiting trial. Due to all the men flipping to the state, the rest of the family was brought forward, and everyone got a piece of the pie. In 2002, Vita Bile went to trial on numerous charges, and as a result, Frank D'Amato took his place as acting conciliaire. That same year, James Gallo was convicted and sentenced to anywhere between 25 to 30 years behind bars. Consalvo and Rago would be convicted for the murder of Larasso, but both men ended up accepting a plea agreement that sentenced them to two and a half decades behind bars. In 2003, Frank D'Amato confessed to Rico conspiracy charges only two weeks before his trial and got 10 years. That same year, police discovered that Riggi had been running the family from behind bars and had been dishing out murders through his meetings with Vitabile. As a result, in September, his sentence was extended by an entire decade. Later that year, family captain Charles Stango got 13 years for conspiracy to commit murder alongside a crew of 10 others. In late 2003, Abramo, Vitabile, and Schifoliti were convicted for a number of murder charges. Then, in 2004, Girolamo Palermo was convicted as well and got house arrest. Meanwhile, on July 29, 2005, a year before the trial sequence had even concluded, Sclafani walked out of jail, an aging but free man. By this point in time, the failing organization was led by Miranda in Riggi's place. In 2006, Philip Abramo was sentenced to life behind bars for five counts of first degree, loan sharking, stock fraud, and more. Scifoliti was tried for two counts of murder and two counts of murder conspiracy, and in 2006, got life in prison. And in the same trial, Vitabile got life as well. That same month, Girolamo Palermo got over 20 years behind bars. With Vitabile and D'Amato both in jail, the role of conciliar then went to family captain Frank Negro. Later that year, Charles Majuri was convicted and sentenced as well, signifying the end of the massive trial. By the end of it, most of the organization was sitting behind bars, with over 10 men having flipped to the state. Palermo, Capo, Rotondo, Scarabino, and Greco all went into Witsec, as the sun continued to set on the now practically dead De Cavalcante family. Things went silent in the region for a while. Joe Miranda came out of the trial as the new acting boss of the family, and he began to try and put the pieces back together. Following the conclusion of the trial, most of the men in the family were behind bars, and there wasn't much money being put out on the street. Between 2005 and 2006, Miranda made a dozen new men into the organization, many of which were younger Sicilian immigrants. And as soon as the trial was over, the gangsters were back out in the street, earning for the new boss. However, nearing the end of 2006, the new skipper decided to step down to the role of underboss, and Frank Guaracci became the new boss.
Guaracci was born all the way back in 1955 in Ribera, Sicily. Ribera was the historic homeland of the family, and in 1967, Guaracci's family came overseas to the US. By 1989, he was a made man, inducted by then boss John Riggi, and remained a soldier until 2005 when he was promoted to capo. Following Miranda stepping down, Guaracci would become the official acting boss of the family, running the day-to-day -day rackets alongside his underboss. Guaracci continued to improve the scene in North Jersey in hopes of recovering fully from the destructive indictments. Meanwhile, Abramo, Vitabile, and Scifoliti were about to receive some good news. In September of 2008, the three men began to petition for their sentences to be cancelled due to a technical issue their lawyers had discovered, and a federal appeals court decided to look into the case. Apparently, during the trial, the prosecution had brought forth eight co-conspirators to give statements against the three gangsters. However, the co-conspirators had already taken plea deals prior to, and according to an unrelated 2004 Supreme Court case, the statements given in plea deals were considered inadmissible in the trials of other defendants. And so, the lawyers argued that their sentences should be overturned and the men retrialed. The appeals court decided to toss out the cases and retrial the men, since they were the only three who never accepted a guilty plea. Scifoliti got out, while Vitabile got out in 2013, and Abramo in 2018. Girolamo Palermo also tried appealing his conviction, but his situation was different, and on March 2nd, 2009, his appeal was rejected, and as of today, he's still behind bars. In 2009, Charles Majuri walked out of prison and returned to the streets. Meanwhile, life also continued as normal for Vinnie Palermo, who was now hiding out in Houston, Texas as the owner of numerous topless bars in the city. It was discovered by the New York Daily News that Palermo was living under the assumed name James Cabella. The police had been coming after the ex-mobster as they alleged that his strip clubs were centers of illegal prostitution and drug rings in the metropolitan area. The next morning, following the news report, KPRC-TV began an investigation into Palermo and aired it on live TV and only 40 days following, the gangster put his Houston area mansion up for sale. He reduced the price over time but in June of 2011, decided to take the listing down, since it wasn't selling. Nearing the end of that same year, Palermo was sued by the former owner of one of his clubs, as he had only paid 5k of the $1.3 million price he'd bought it for originally. But on March 4 of 2014, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. His house finally sold in 2016, and as things stand today, both of the clubs he originally owned are now closed down. Back in Jersey, the gangsters were yet again facing some legal issues. By 2009, Guaracci was the family's main leader, operating as an acting boss on Riggi's behalf and working directly alongside underboss Joe Miranda. However, in 2010, Guaracci was indicted for extortion after he tried to force the Lenny's Brick Oven Pizza in Washington Township to pay him a protection fee. On July 4, Guaracci and two other gangsters, 29-year-old John Coaster and 60-year-old Michael Noble, walked into the busy restaurant around 9 p.m. Guaracci approached the restaurant's general manager and began poking him in the chest as he described himself as the guy in charge. He told the owner that the establishment would have to start paying daily protection to the family and demanded that the man hand over the nightly receipts to one of the gangsters with him. When he said no, however, the boss fell into a fit of rage. He began yelling curses at the manager as customers fled the restaurant with unfinished meals left behind. Gracchi told the manager, quote, I run the show. 
as he and his two bodyguards left the place shaken up. Although Gracchi had never been convicted of any crime prior to the incident, the two men around him had different stories to tell. Nobile had been a street thug in Brooklyn, who was arrested in 2000 for assaulting a victim with a bat. However, after getting out in 2005 on parole, he went back to the victim and made sure the man wouldn't testify. Following this, he began to hang with members of the De Cavalcante family. Coaster, although without a prior arrest, was a man who hung out at the pizza place often and had already threatened the owner before the incident. In January of 2012, Guarachi got six months of house arrest, which would be followed by five-year-long probation. Meanwhile, on January 23rd, a 52-year-old Anthony Capo would pass from a heart attack while at home in Witsec. Conselvo and Rago were released on February 14, and both men returned to work in the street. While awaiting Abramo's release date, Consalvo would become the acting captain of his crew, since the men were in-laws. Consalvo was likely going to see a bump up the chain to an administrative role in the coming few years. Later that year, Frank D'Amato left prison and returned to the street as a family soldier. On November 27, 2012, Reggie finally stepped out of the Devons Federal Medical Center after sitting behind bars for over two decades. He was an ailing man who was slowly dying, and so lived in an assisted living situation with a doctor in Edison. On December 24, 2014, a 91-year-old Miranda would pass away, and in his place went street boss Joseph Merlo. Then, on August 3rd, 2015, a 90-year-old Riggie would pass away. By that point in time, he'd been family boss for three and a half decades. And with Riggie gone, Guarachi would be elevated to the position of official De Cavalcante boss. It's 2012. FBI agent Giovanni Rocco enters a casino steakhouse in Atlantic City, South Jersey. He's there under the false identity of Giovanni Gatto, a North Jersey outlaw biker turned mafioso, and he's procuring a purchase of cocaine from Jimmy Smalls Heaney, an Elizabeth-based cocaine dealer who worked with the Bloods gang. Rocco and another agent meet with Smalls at the restaurant to buy a 200 gram bag of coke in exchange for a supply of counterfeit designer clothing the government had seized in a prior sting operation. The agents got their coke and left. The plethora of luxury items established a solid name for the undercover Fed, and through his new connections with Smalls, Rocco would meet a man named Luigi Olivieri, an alleged made man of the De Cavalcante family. Luigi was a sloppy man who earned an okay pay and ran a pizza place in Elizabeth. He had a reputation for disrespect after an incident with Sclafani in which he poked the man in the stomach as a joke. Rocco and Olivieri got closer with time, and Olivieri ended up inviting the agent to an Italian feast in Peterson, Elizabeth. The agent continued his undercover operation into the local drug trafficking ring, which had now transformed into an investigation into the Mafia family as a whole. In one incident, Rocco was standing at his daughter's soccer tournament when he was approached by Gambino mobster Danny Bertelli, who he knew through his gangland connections. Bertelli, confused as to why Rocco was there, said, quote, Giovanni, what are you doing here? Rocco quickly made up a lie that he was there to help out an ex-girlfriend, whose husband was behind bars, and the Mafia soldier believed him and continued on his day. Eventually, with time, Rocco rose up in the organization and finally met Charles Stango. Stango was an interesting man. A capo in North Jersey, Stango resided in Las Vegas. He was an animated character who, recklessly, often spoke over the phone. 
He'd been arrested back in 2002 for murder conspiracy, and after getting out a decade later, moved to the suburbs of Henderson, just outside of Las Vegas. As caught on wiretap, Stango explained his reasoning for moving to Henderson. I planted the fucking flag in fucking New Orleans, in Las Vegas, fucking LA. Essentially, he was trying to grow the diminished crime family's reach across the US and into profitable territories like Vegas. The Gambling Central had long been an essential element to the Chicago Mafia outfit, but following a series of failures in the 70s and 80s, the gangland presence there had diminished. Stango used his son to carry out his orders on the street back home in Jersey, talking to him mostly over the phone. When Rocco rose up in the organization, he managed to infiltrate Stango's crew and thus get close to the mafioso's son and later the mafia captain himself. He tapped the man's phones, which led to an almost constant stream of surveillance on the many rackets they were running. The agent quickly learned of a massive beef Stango was facing with Olivieri, a man he despised as much as a person can be despised. Although Olivieri was technically a made man, most of the other gangsters hated him and refused to accept him as one of them. Stango, however, had a special hatred for Olivieri due to the disrespect he'd shown the old school Sclafani, and he wanted the man's head for it. Rocco then flew out to Vegas to meet with Stango for the first time. The two men met at the captain's suburban home outside the strip and they quickly got down to business. Stango immediately expressed his disgust at Olivieri, telling the agent that he, quote, gotta maim him or you just gotta put him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life or somebody's gotta get a fucking jar of acid and throw it in his fucking face. Then he told Rocco that he wanted him to take care of the hit contract and that would in turn lead to Rocco getting made. The FBI had to think and act quick, before it was too late. It's February 1st, 2015. Undercover FBI agent Giovanni Rocco flies out to Las Vegas to meet with New Jersey Captain Charles Stango for the second time. Stango wanted to plan the murder of Luigi Olivieri with the agent, and so the two men got down to business. He told him he wanted to get two outlaw bikers to do the hit, which would pay each of them 25k. The plan was for the officer to give the two bikers each photos of Olivieri and have them stay a while in Elizabeth as they stalked the man's day-to-day -day patterns. Although the family administration had not been informed of the hit job, Stango reassured the agent that it'd be okay and that afterwards they'd come to accept it. It turns out Stango had reached out to family conciliar Negro for approval on the hit against Olivieri, but he'd never gotten a direct answer back, and this had ultimately saved Olivieri's life. Irregardless, this is where the operation had to end. They now had Stango planning a murder on tape, and as a result, they quickly pulled Rocco out of the field. It's now the early morning of March 12, 2015. Officers knock on the front door of Charles Stangle's home in Henderson, Nevada, where the gangster lived with his girlfriend. They also targeted nine other men back home in Jersey, including family conciliar Frank Negro and Stango's son Anthony. The raid was the largest one since the December 1999 arrest wave, and the men were booked for drug trafficking, prostitution, and murder conspiracy charges. During the trials, numerous pieces of evidence were brought forwards, including a taped conversation between Stango and his son, in which the men discussed propping up an illegal escort business in Tom's River, a New Jersey township that had become a central hub for the De Cavalcante family. You need to protect yourself with what you're going to do now. You have to be smart. Very smart, Stango told Anthony as he continued explaining the plan in detail. He instructed his son to set up a perfectly legal club with low drink prices as a front for the prostitution ring, as that kind of establishment would attract high-end, white-collar businessmen. He told his son to be as legally under the radar as possible. 
Anthony told his dad that his idea was to set up an out-of-view warehouse where the central escort business would be based. The prostitutes would charge whatever price they decided, but the mafiosi would get a $350 cut per hour, $50 of which would go to a criminal lawyer the younger Stango had hired. Although the lawyer was never named, his role was to set up the illicit business and post bond for anyone who got in trouble with the law. He only spoke in person with the young Stango, who apparently secretly had escort-related blackmail on the man if he ever decided to flip. Also charged in the investigation were the guys working in Heaney's crew, including Olivieri, for selling coke and stolen cigarettes. Meanwhile, some internal changes were taking place over in Jersey. On April 14, 2016, family boss Frank Guaracci, an ailing Sicilian gangster, passed away after suffering from cancer. With him out of the picture, his role went to the aging Charles Majuri, who'd been vying for the spot since his placement on the three-man panel two decades prior. He was finally running things in the region, although now incredibly old. The Tom's River crew continued to face legal issues. Stango's son Anthony pleaded guilty to his charges, getting six years in late 2016, and on December 7, Stango pleaded guilty as well to conspiracy to commit murder. As a part of his plea deal, Stango's other charges would be dropped, and he got 10 years behind bars in March of 2017. Meanwhile, John Capozzi, Nicholas DeGidio, and Mario Galli, members of Stango's Tom River crew, were all charged for trafficking coke. All 10 of the men involved ended up pleading guilty and taking deals, including Heaney. Heaney got 5 years, while Olivieri got off with a pretty light sentence, since his only charge was possessing contraband cigarettes. He got out around 2019. Negro was never charged for any crime, but after his arrest, stepped down, and was replaced by Giuseppe Schifoliti. The Toms River and Haney crews had been dealt a serious blow, and since they were some of the remaining silent crews still earning for the organization, it also dealt a deadly blow to the entire family. As things stand, the De Cavalcante family is in a strange state. Since the bust against the Toms River operation and the rivals in Elizabeth, not much has happened with the organization, a sign of the new world they live in. In April of 2017, Mafia soldier Jerry Balzano pleaded guilty to physically assaulting a driver during a road rage incident. Balzano was one of many charged back in 2011 in a mob sweep, the largest sweep in American history that saw over 120 men arrested. Although the investigation targeted New York, a few members of the De Cavalcante organization were arrested, including Balzano, who was charged with tax refund theft and possession of contraband. He was out in two years on supervised release parole. The day of the road rage incident, the driver of the vehicle in question caught Balzano off on the upstate highway, leading to Balzano slowly pulling in front of the man and stopping his Lincoln sedan. He then got out of the car, walked towards the driver, and began to yell at and attack the man. The entire thing was caught on the driver's dash cam, with the incident being diffused by another driver. Many have speculated that the other man was in fact another gangster who knew Balzano. Balzano gave an apology in court, saying, quote, I'd like to apologize to the court for taking up your time 
and to my wife and children, as well as to the gentleman I had the altercation with. I just lost control, and it blew out of proportion, like a snowball effect. Although the soldier was facing a two-year sentence for parole violation, he ended up getting 11 months behind bars and 21 months of supervised release. On July 9, 2020, Mario Galli pleaded guilty to drug trafficking and firearm possession. The then 28-year-old Galli had been charged with drug trafficking while armed with a loaded 9mm. And following a police raid on his home, they found hundreds of grams of coke as well as the gun in question. At the time, he was out on supervised release following the 2015 Tom's River bust. On June 3, 2021, underboss Joseph Merlo passed away, leading to Philip Abramo taking his position. In July of 2022, Stango was released early and went to move into a New York halfway house. On January 2, 2023, family capo Paolo Farina passed away at the age of 96. He'd been an old-time gangster who had a long and decorated career in the organization since its very beginnings, and his death was a shock. The current state of the organization remains unknown, although most believe that the DeCavalcante family has gone under and is essentially all but dead. Cases like those of Stango and Galley prove otherwise. In fact, it seems as though the North Jersey family is very active and still getting noticeable under the table action. However, it seems to have undergone a similar effect other supposedly dead families across the nation have experienced. Since the destructive trials of Palermo, Capo, and Rotondo, the Mafia has slowly transitioned from an organized Italian syndicate into another organized crime group like those across the country, focused mainly on business. Although the men of the old generation are still in charge and running things in the family, those under them are likely no longer Italian or even half Italian, but rather unorganized criminals who picked up work under the family. There's no longer a major incentive to get made in the Cavalcante organization, considering the high police attention the role brings with it. Although it's unknown how many made men and capos are actually out on the street in North Jersey today, it's likely not many. They, like the other Mafia families across the country, have shifted noticeably from their old practices to much more business-focused ones. Things like white-collar crime, fraud, and prostitution. Meanwhile, a lot of the men involved have focused almost entirely on regular legal business work, leaving behind most of their old mob rackets. The necessity for getting into Mafia crime that once existed within their communities has died with the shifting American culture. Most of those who lived the life didn't want it for their children, and those children grew up to be regular adults who didn't want it for their own children. And with the new wave of social gentrification in America, the rise of the digital information age, the increase of security measures across the nation, and the shifting focus of police from organized crime to counterterrorism, the future of the family as a traditional mafia seems bleak. But the futures of those younger men still seriously involved with it may be promising, but only time will tell.